This class is E1, Leading the Workforce Through Lens of Love. The guides today are Susan Ryan and Steve McLilly, and they'll be uh, presenting today the nurse uh, surveys. I will have a stack in the back if I missed you somehow, and I'll give the code at the end of the session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm Susan Ryan. I'm the Senior Director for the Greenhouse Project. And the first thing I want to do is invite our friends in the back to just come a little closer and um, make yourself some friends at other tables. We do have some table activity that we will do at the end of this session. So I really want to make sure that you're not sitting so low and that uh, you will make some friends with some other people. Here's what I've learned. The more that we share with one another, the more we all grow. And so there's something really invaluable about coming together. So let's talk about the session. And the first thing I'm going to do is invite my panel to find their, their seats up here. I'm going to introduce them in just a minute. Steve McAlilly. Steve is the CEO of Methodist Senior Services. He has the distinction of being the leader who embraced the greenhouse model. First greenhouse homes opened in 2003 in Tupelo, Mississippi. I always say the birthplace of Elvis and the birthplace of the greenhouse model. Um, I also call him the godfather of greenhouse. So, and, and I mean that with all incredible respect. If he had not done what he did, if he had not said, I'm going to do this, where would we be today? But he as a leader embraced meaningful, radical change, and he went forward. Next to, next to Steve is Casey uh, Wood. Casey's the administrator and a guide for greenhouse homes in, in Tupelo, Mississippi. And I had asked Steve, I said, send me just a little bit about Casey. And something that I read that I put on the screen that I'm going to read, I have a special interest in creating the best life for elders through fun and living life. That tells you a whole lot about leading through the lens of love. And last but certainly not least is Tarlin Gates. Tarlin is currently a staff development coordinator for um, her community, the Greenhouse Homes in Tupelo, Mississippi. More than that, though, you should know that Tarlin was the first Shabazz. Anybody know what a Shabazz is? <laughs> so a Shabazz is a direct care worker within the greenhouse home. Different title, there's a whole legend behind it. But she was the first one that embraced that universal worker role, the self-managed work teams, before there was any prototype to really fully understand what is it and how do you do it. She was one of the first. Tarlin is still a part of the organization and has had kind of a growth plan, which also has an awful lot to say about leading through the lens of love. She was a guide for the greenhouse homes, and as I mentioned, she's now staff development coordinator. Get over here. So anybody dealing with any of these things that I've identified as some top trends or concerns? I just was talking to someone this morning who said, um, regulatory oversight. We're in our survey window. Life almost stops when you're in your survey window. Any of these things keep you up at night, reimbursement struggles. So I did a webinar not long ago, and I did a survey. I was able to do a live survey with people that were attending the webinar, and I asked them, I want you to list the things that are keeping you up at night. 60% of everybody that was on the webinar said workforce was their number one concern. When I attended the workforce session here yesterday, it was a, a pretty full house. I think, obviously, it is something that's resonating with all of you. And here's why. The boomers are aging. Did anybody pick up this book? I thought this was a remarkable little handout from yesterday. Anybody at yesterday's session? It's phenomenal, and it'll give you a few of those stats. So I'm a boomer, and I can tell you, we changed the world. <laughs> and we, we will change long-term care. 
And as boomers are aging and there are changing demographics, there are more of us, and we will impact long-term care as we never have before. The other thing is, who's gonna care for all of the boomers? Here's a slide to give you some perspective. You can see the projected change of people that are age 65 or above on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, how many workers are there to support them? Those are pretty staggering. So is it no wonder? I was reading an article in McKnight's, and it said the workforce shortage is a train wreck waiting to happen. Anybody agree with that statement? Yeah. So what are some of the challenges? Anybody dealing with turnover? So here's what the little booklet said. 45 to 66% turnover. Anybody experiencing maybe more? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that you're not alone. Trust me. I have seen turnover. People have said it's 100 plus percent. We just can't keep people. Well, what is the cost? Cost of turno turnover per person is about $2,200. That's got a significant impact on the organization. So turnover is a big issue. Here's the other thing, paying a living wage. Anybody challenged with being able to really ensure that you're paying a living wage and that those folks that you are, are paying don't have to have two and three jobs in order to make ends meet for them. That's not a recipe for success. What about competition? I had a conversation with somebody who said, oh my gosh, things have been really good, but there's a Walmart that's just ready to open down the street from us. And when that happens, we are quite sure that there will be a mass exodus as they go to make that living wage. The other thing I've heard people say is that they can make more money flipping burgers than they can with what I'm able to pay for them. So competition is coming in and creating more of a challenge in being able to really find those folks that are the folks we want to equip and bring into our organizations. What about ageist stereotypes? Would that play into it? How do you think people feel about the jobs? How do you think people feel about elders in general? in elders in long-term care. So here's something that I read. It, it was um, an article that I, I read, and, and you can hear, first of all, a reality expressed, but then you'll also hear some stereotypes and stigma. It's a low wage, low to no benefit, and often thankless job. One that involves everything from bathing and feeding to dealing with incontinence and cognitive decline. Does that sound like the lens of love? As we are looking at a problem that is profound, as we are trying to think about what are the solutions, I posit the solution is that we need to find leaders that will lead through the lens of love. I found this quote, those who see the world through the lens of, of love are the true visionaries. And I will say it's all about leadership. And I will probably say that more than one time in this presentation. So what are our perceptions? You can see these lenses up there. When you put on your, your lens, this morning I was talking to Steve. It was an interesting uh, conversation. And he says, I'm the eternal optimist. I would say Steve has those glasses that enable him to kind of see the situation through a lens of love. Have you thought about your perception or misperception about your own belief systems and how that might be impacting your, your view and your reality? In the greenhouse model, we use a construct that I think is really important for leaders to understand. And the first thing is that we all have underlying beliefs. We all have a mindset. 
we all have a perception of how we think and feel about aging, about elders in long-term care, and about the workforce. Here's a true story. I was talking to a leader once. I had done some education and training, had been there for about a week, and I was really impressed with this incredible team of future Shabazim. They were CNAs that were getting equipped with our education. I was so impressed, I said to the COO, I said, what did you do to recruit such a fine group of people? I'll never forget his words. He says, you wait. In six months, they'll all be gone. He says, you can't, you can't pay them enough to have them stay. He says, you can't trust them. And he says, they won't be here much longer than six months. What do you think happened in six months? They were gone. How did he view them in terms of that ability to trust, in terms of his ability to empower that team to really leverage and to look through the lens of love to be able to equip them for success? That misperception, that belief was coloring his whole view of what he saw. It was a fear-based perception and not the lens of love. Often in culture change, we focus on the behaviors that need to change. The, if we are talking about an empowered workforce, we're going to identify, so what needs to change in terms of the person? What behavior do we need to see from this person instead of addressing first those underlying beliefs that are so critical to identifying, to acknowledging, to understanding, so that we reframe and we really adapt a new mindset, a new belief system to help us then to address the behaviors that will need to change as we've changed our beliefs. And the last thing that's so important, you can't go back to the traditional system and expect new behaviors and beliefs to operate well. So it's identify those beliefs which will kind of define the behaviors, beha the behaviors you want to see and then the systems underneath to make it work. So the greenhouse is predicated and built on core values. And if you are engaged in culture change, I would tell you that it's comprehensive change. And it's important to look at all three of these values when you're thinking about how do I really lead through the lens of love. The first one is real home. Second core value is meaningful life. And the third is empowered staff. So the first one, when you look at real home, what do you see here? What do you notice about the physical environment that would say real home? Say it. It's, it's definitely home. What makes you think it's home? You see the family. So you see some intergenerational opportunities happen. You know, there's like real stuff there. It doesn't look institutional at all but it really looks like a real home. So relationship-rich, person-directed living. Anybody trying to do person-centered care? Of course, of course. That's philosophically what we're all trying to do. Take it a step further. Meaningful life, to have meaningful life, you need to be in deep knowing relationships so that people, residents, elders are able to direct not just their care, but their lives. So a person is able to live a meaningful life because of those relationships that form. And the deep knowing that, cur that occurs when you see a person as an individual and not as them, what do they need? But you see intrinsic worth with each individual. Last but not least is empowered staff. And I'm going to play a real quick video. This is a video that was um, a Shabazz that's uh, actually they're called uh, Adir in the Jewish Senior Life Organization and this is in Rochester, New York. So you can hear Ashley's testimonial of what she really believes. I've been working at the Jewish home for seven years now and I love it. 
The people are very loving, nurturing, compassionate, and team players. They make it their duty to assist you and help you and make sure that you're doing your job to the best of your abilities. That's why I love the Jewish home. For a resident to tell me thank you or I appreciate you for you know doing certain things that they went, they're not able to do on their own. So that's the most rewarding part for me. They offered um, a CNA um, training and I took that opportunity and they also offering nursing programs and reimbursements for that. If you want to excel in a nursing field, they will definitely help you. I'm all for teamwork. I feel like teamwork make a dream work. And so far it has made a dream work. Um, far as the cottages, how beautiful they became, um, the um, growth for the residents, some residents wasn't really interacting with other residents, but now that they have came to the greenhouses and they have different opportunities and different activities, they are interacting with people. They coming out their rooms. Just to put a smile on somebody's face by helping them makes me happy, like it really burns my soul. I knew that this job was everything I needed and more. It was life-changing. It was life-changing. So what did you see that resonated with you? What struck you? She's smiling for one thing. When you think back to that quote that I had, it's a thankless job. Think about the contrast between what she was saying and about what was said in the newspaper, about what often is a true statement. It often can be a very thankless job. So let's talk about empowerment. Because empowerment doesn't just happen, voila, you're empowered and it's done. But what is it and how does it happen and why is that important when you think about leadership through the lens of love? It's all about leadership. And so leadership in a greenhouse model really changes to a coaching approach. And if you were here in yesterday's session, you probably heard Sue Mazorski talk a lot about that coaching approach and how important it is. My background is nursing. I was a former director of nursing. I was paid to tell people what to do and how to do it. I was paid to solve problems and to create solutions. Not so in a greenhouse. I am part of a team. It's participative decision making. It is really collaboration, the art of solving problems together because guess what? As a nurse, I didn't see everything that needed to be brought into the conversation to really solve problems well. And so it's all about leadership. It's all about taking your hierarchy and there we go, putting the elder at the very center. When you think about your organizational chart, what sits at the top? Who sits at the top? The administrator. Where is power? Where are decisions made? Right at the top. That's where everything happens. Who has the least amount of power? The CNA. Are elders even on most organizational charts? Not typically. And in my paradigm prior to Greenhouse, I never saw an elder. So ours are concentric circles. There is no hierarchy. There is no top and bottom. It's circles. And bullseye, I call it the nucleus, if you will, where everything happens is the elder, surrounded by those working closest to the elder. This is an intentional structure in order to empower your teams. If you want meaningful life to happen with elders, you've got to empower those that are working closest to the elder. Elders at the center surrounded by those that um, are working closest to the elder in collaboration with the clinical support team, and really making sure that together we are a team, we are here to ensure that that elder is living meaningful life and that Shabbosim are, are supported. You will notice I bolded the word consistent assignments. What happens if you don't have consistent assignments? There are no relationships, precisely. And if you don't have the relationships, how can an elder have a meaningful life? And so this is the intention that leaders must take, be it your organizational diagram and a leadership who really believes that it's all about balancing the support and the accountability for these teams. 
Education is another thing. What are we doing? You know, I can remember conversations in my pre-greenhouse days. Do they have a pulse? Can we make sure that they, you know, they're living and breathing and let's get them started? How quickly can we get them started? What are we doing to invest in quality education to make sure that we are equipping our care teams with the skills and everything that they need for success? This is just a little bit of what Greenhouse does. So now I'm going to get out of the way, and I'm going to turn it over to the panel because I want you to hear from their own words. This is where the rubber hits the road. These are people that have been doing it ever since 2003, and they've, they've had some bumps and bruises. Life has happened, and Steve and I said this morning, you know, I wish I could say if you just do the greenhouse model, it's like magic. It's the magic bullet. Everything will be perfect. And you can just walk away and say, well, I'm glad we did that. Change is hard work. But you're going to hear what does it take to engage in change? What does it take to sustain change? What is the role of leadership in really equipping and empowering those teams? So with that, take it away. OK, thanks, Susan. Uh, before I, I uh, tell my little piece of the story, I want to uh, just comment on one thing. We asked, uh, as Susan and I were working uh, to put this together, uh, we thought about uh, a, a way to, to, to present our thoughts about love and leadership and, and why it mattered in a greenhouse. And we thought for sure that, that uh, Tarlin Gates, who was one of the world's first Shabazim, and who was here on our team and helped us figure this out when it was just a goofy idea in the mind of a bearded Pied Piper from upstate New York. Uh, so, so Tarlin naturally has been with us uh, from before day one. And then Casey is the new kid on the block. So we thought it would be good to, to uh, share this story through her eyes. But there are two people in the room that I want to recognize uh, who are a part of our organization who aren't on this panel, but they are there in the trenches every day doing this. And John Steyerwalt, wave your hand, John. John is our executive director in Tupelo at Traceway that has um, the overall responsibility for that campus and our greenhouses. And uh, he could tell this story as well as anybody. And then uh, Rebecca Anderson, wave Rebecca. Uh, is our uh, executive director on the Gulf Coast in Gulfport, Mississippi, and she operates a greenhouse that's a, a licensed assisted living. So she's doing it there, uh, but they're a part of this team. Together, one of the things that, that um, I think is critically important is to, is to try to build a culture uh, in which we're able to respond to what I call is the peeling paint theory. Uh, I notice the paint that's peeling at your house, but I don't notice the paint that's peeling at my house. <laughs> and uh, so we, we hold each other accountable through a lens of love that's sometimes tough uh, because it needs to be uh, to, to see the pe paint that's peeling that we've grown uh, colorblind to, and it happens and it continues to happen to us on a day-to-day -day basis. That being said, I want to quickly get my part of the story out of the way and move it on to the people that are in the trenches and, and doing the work. I came uh, to our organization almost 26 years ago now, and I came with the ability to see the peeling paint because I was a, in another world. I practiced law. So I literally was coming from the outside in and, and was a volunteer in our organization, which is a statewide organization in Mississippi. Um, and, and somehow I got the idea that, that um, I could uh, be involved um, as the CEO and feel a lot more useful on a day-to-day -day basis doing that than practicing law. Somehow I convinced the board of directors of that, and they hired me. Knowing what I know now, wouldn't have hired me back then, but they did, and I've learned a lot along the way. Uh, but I came in with the ability to see the paint that was peeling, and it just stunned me uh, that almost every week I would get a phone call from somebody 
about something that went wrong or somebody was mad at, whether it was a family member or a resident or employee. And I kept thinking, we got to be able to do better than this, people. What is going on? And we're in the process of, uh, of uh, building a specially designed uh, facility for people who had Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and so we were looking at some of the best designs around the country, and along the way, I happened to get to hear Bill Thomas do a presentation on the Eden Alternative. Uh, and when I first heard that, it resonated deeply uh, somewhere inside of me that this was what I was searching for that was missing in our organization. And so I came back to Mississippi from a conference where I heard Bill speak, committed that as long as I could take a breath, I was going to be working to see that any elder who lived in Mississippi had the choice to live in a place that practiced the Eden alternative principles. That started a relationship between Bill and me that evolved and grew closer over the years. And as we were on this path to figure out a better way to do skilled nursing care, Bill started talking about greenhouse. In fact, I told him one time about our wonderful new design of our new nursing home. It's going to be a 140-bed nursing home. It's going to be the coolest design in the world. It's going to be two stories. We're going to have town halls and be, be uh, in neighborhoods. And he said, you know, I'm not sure that's what we ought to be building anymore. So I go, well, if not that, what? Uh, of course, he didn't have the answer at the time. And that just haunted me. It was rolling around in my mind, and he finally came up with the concept of a greenhouse, which is essentially a small home um, for 10 or so elders to live uh, and continue to grow and be and become and a place where a self-managed work team uh, works together to, to uh, bring meaningful life to not, to not only the people who live there, but to the people who work there too and to the family members. Uh, through a, several flukes, we wound up becoming the first people uh, to work out Bill's idea and put them in practice. And that's how the first greenhouses um, became um, located in Tupelo, Mississippi, of all places. Uh, I, I learned later that you're supposed to have research data proving that you do, you can do whatever it is you're supposed to be trying to do. Uh, but if we all waited on that, we'd still be riding trains across the country because in 1895 the Wright brothers didn't know that man couldn't fly because all the research data at the time says there's no way human beings will ever fly in a powered machine. Uh, so they would have just kept Drive, you know, riding trains. Well, we didn't know any better in Tupelo, and we believed in this idea and this concept, and we blazed our trail. Uh, I, I can say it's been one of the most, one of the hardest things that I've ever been a part of. Uh, it's also been one of the most gratifying things that I've ever been a part of. Uh, it, as, as Susan mentioned, it's not a magic bullet. Um, uh, it's, it's not a pill that you can take and wake up and everything's hunky-dory. We uh, fight the dragon daily, trying to drag us back into the institutional world. And some days it's Tarlin saying, hey, wait a minute, this ain't right. And then some days it's me saying it, and some days it's John saying it, and some days it's our chief operating officer reminding us. But, but we all slip back because when... The surveyors are coming to town, or this is happening, or that's happening. Uh, the, the simple thing is to revert back to the way we used to do things, and, and that is administration solves problems and fixes things and has the answers. And we forget that, you know, the answers are right there in front of us if we'll just sit and listen and learn, not only the elders, but the frontline employees usually have a better way. So I've come full circle to not only being part of the team that created these and, and tries to hold uh, our each other accountable um, to, to the goodness of the greenhouse, 
uh, to becoming a family member. Uh, my parents both lived in a greenhouse. My mother still does. My dad died in a greenhouse in December. And thankfully, uh, he was a, a United Methodist pastor. And uh, he would say, I get up every morning and thank God for this place. And then he would bitch about this and that. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, he, he had high standards. <laughs> uh, but but anyway, uh, but uh, I, I'm grateful for, for that. And, and also that the Saturday before he died on a Wednesday night, I went over to the greenhouse and uh, fried oysters and hush puppies for the people in the house. And I want to say, find me a 140-bed nursing home designed in neighborhoods that will let you have that kind of experience. And if you do, move in. But, but it's those kind of things that you can't, uh, you can't pay for. Uh, there's, you can't put a price on them. That makes all the difference in the world. Uh, what I want to, I, I want to turn it over to them, and then at some point you'll ask me the question about engagement. Remember to do that. So that, that's my story, how we got where we are. Uh, I, I've learned one other thing, and I, I'll confess this publicly uh, and ask for forgiveness from John and Casey and Tarlin. Um, too often when the surveyors are pounding on you or the chief financial officers talking money, you know, the CEO says, to the COO, Alan, we got to have a good survey. There's too much riding on it now. There's the five-star system. There's reductions in, in uh, uh, funding. We've got to have a survey. So then that gets ramped up from Alan, and Alan goes to John, and John, John, we've got to have a good survey. Steve said, da 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 and this, and so that gets ramped up from John to Casey, and then Casey goes Tarlin, <laughs> and and in each level it ramps and ramps and ramps till before you know it, at the front line everybody is afraid, and 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 I own that uh, as as the one who's ultimately responsible for the outcomes. I own my. Uh, failures in contributing that kind of client, uh, cli climate. Uh, and it's so hard to keep that from being the focus. And what, wind, what, you, what winds up happening is you're focusing on the task rather than the elder. And Tarlin and I had a conversation not two weeks ago about that. And, uh, and I, I just want to say, always remember that part of the dragon that our our zeal for for making it as good as it can be can sometimes through innocence get ramped up and amplified and before you know it you forgot uh, as they say when you're knee deep in alligators the first thing <laughs> you forget the first thing you came to do was to drain the swamp and or let's remember to drain the swamp so now who wants to go next Tarlin or Casey <laughs> okay, so my career started um, as a geriatric psychologist, and I traveled with the state to different nursing homes throughout Mississippi, and I did assessments on elders who were depressed or had um, living with schizophrenia or dementia, and they had the loneliness and helplessness and boredom. So I was tasked to go into the nursing homes and find ways through conversation with them how we can combat these things. And it seemed that every nursing home I went to, the elder was, well, this would make me feel better, but they won't let me do it here. This will make me feel better, but I can't do that here. They told me they didn't have the money to do this here. And so it was just a constant struggle of going and seeing an elder and then two weeks later seeing them again, and there was no improvement because they lived in this environment. I did that for a few years, and then I moved to a nursing facility about 30 minutes from where I am now. It's a beautiful facility. Um, it, on the outside, it's, it's gorgeous. It has a grand staircase. People see it. They think this is the place to go because it's so beautiful. 
And I can tell you I worked there five years, and it was nothing like the greenhouses. Um, it's, it's the institutional setting, the institutional creep, the dragon. You had elders when you walked in lining the halls, asking to go do things that they never could get to go do. Uh, two people to a room, aides running around trying to satisfy them as fast as they could, families getting frustrated because it wasn't being done fast enough, elders getting to being frustrated because it wasn't done fast enough. And I worked there for five years in the social work admission setting. And it was always sad to me as an admissions coordinator when somebody had to come into the nursing home, there was never any excitement behind it. And not that that's necessarily the most exciting time for anybody, but you know, we want it to be a new place to come and live. And we never got that there. I felt like I never got that there. Uh, I was at a conference one day, an Alzheimer's conference, and I heard Steve talk and show the greenhouse video. And I looked over at my coworker and I said, I'm going to work there one day. And she was like, no, you're not leaving us. And I said, no, I will work there one day. And four years later, uh, April of last year, I got my chance. <laughs> so um, I'm an administrator at the greenhouse homes. I think some of the biggest differences I see is just the love and the compassion. These, these elders live in houses that are 10 to 12 a home, and the Shabazim love on them like they're family. Uh, one of the first impressions I got was I walked into a greenhouse and the Shabazim were cooking lunch, and they were, they were plating the lunches, but nobody was asking the elder you know, what they wanted because they already knew. They knew somebody wanted extra of this or extra of this or extra of this, and they were all sitting around this table um, in what we call convivium, and they were eating with their Shabazz. Some of the families were there. The elders were eating. They were laughing, having a good time. The cooking was being done in the home. And it was just wonderful to see that family type setting um, and that they could go and, and have lunch with each other. And if somebody wanted something different, that would be given to them. And it's just gone from there. You walk into these homes, and in our greenhouse homes, it's one person to a room. So every elder has their own room. Every room can be decorated the way they choose, painted the way they choose. Uh, so they get to come in and they get to set up their little own home environment. Uh, we have a big celebration when somebody does move in. We try to get all the staff down there to welcome them and explain to them kind of what's going on, let them ask questions. Um, we've got welcome baskets. We do that sort of thing. We always try to do what the elder wants. I can't tell you how many times Tarlin's gone on mall trips and they went and saw the Lion King last week. Um, we, we do so much for them and I think that gives the staff empowerment too because they get to see that elder growing because they're loving on them and they get to see that elder growing because they're the ones helping care for them. Um, on the 4th of July, we got plastic pools, and we had a big pool party, and some of the elders who couldn't normally get in the pool got all their feet in the pool. The Shabazim got in the pool. Everybody was splashing around. It was a good time. So we get to do things like that that were not done where I was before. So I, got to, I get to see now the loneliness and helplessness and boredom. Um, it's, it's not there. I mean, if, if somebody looks bored, we find something for them to do. We find something that they enjoy or that they used to enjoy. Uh, the Shabazim get to know their elders. I've walked in several houses in the morning, and they're doing their hair and their makeup because they know that that's what that elder wants. Um, like I said, they have their own room, so they get their privacy. They get to come out when they want to and just and do things as a family in a group. They can go to other houses and do things like that. Uh, I think as an administrator, just encouraging that relationship with your Shabazim. Um, I've learned the last year to always go and talk with the Shabazim if something's going on. They're the ones that are there. They're the ones that know what's happening. They're the ones that know the elder best. I think as far as making decisions from the, the top of the line, you learn most from your Shabazim. They're with the elder all day. Uh, we go in increments, but they're with, they're with them all day. And if you want to know why somebody's behavior is different or they're not happy that day or something they want, they're the first person to go talk to because they're the one that knows that elder better. I cannot imagine being in any other kind of setting now that I've been in a greenhouse. Um, they're, they're fantastic. They're home. They are home. They, um, they thrive and they love there and they become friends with their Shabazim. We have several that go to the hospital and sit with it, you know, with the elder if they're sick in the hospital or, you know, they just really have ownership of that house, both the elders and the Shabazim. So it's, it's a great place to work and uh, I, I love it and I thank you for the opportunity that I get to work there. <laughs> 
Hi. Um, as uh, Susan and Steve were saying, yes, my name is Tarlin. I am an original Shavazim, one of the first in the world. Uh, I think of all the things that I've uh, accomplished, I think of all the things that I've done, I think that's probably the most, I have the most pride in that. Simply because I have had the, not only the opportunity, but I have been blessed to actually make a huge impact in these elders' lives every day, every single day. I can go home every day and say, I actually made a difference, even if it's just with one person. And um, I'm so humble and I'm so grateful to Mr. McAlilly. And I know he's gonna say, Steve, I know. I already know that speech, yeah. <laughs> but um, when we actually started this, and, and like I said, when I actually was hired in specifically for greenhouses. I had no idea what a greenhouse was. I had never heard of the greenhouse project. I did not know what it was. I literally stumbled into this, but it was the best accident I've ever had, <laughs> literally. Um, when we started doing this, there we had no blueprint. <laughs> we had no instructions. There was no policies. Um, yet yeah, when survey came, it was, we were pretty much making it up as we went. <laughs> and that was the best feeling, to actually be empowered to do that. We would, of course, you know, being in long-term care, and let me say, I never worked in long-term care. I'd never worked in healthcare at all. I, that was never an aspiration of mine. I never wanted to do that. Um, I kind of, like I said, I stumbled into it. But once I got a taste of that traditional, because we worked in Cedars, which was the Cadillac of nursing homes, of traditional nursing homes in Tupelo, it was awful. It, I'm sorry, I mean it was. Even though it was the Cadillac of nursing home, it was awful. And the difference in those elders within a couple of hours when we moved into greenhouses was the most spectacular thing you could ever witness in your life. Because there was such a transformation in them, you could literally see them come back to life. There, and, I, and I'm so, I wish we had the original greenhouse video because even though in that video is 16 years old, every time I watch it, I still get a little emotional and I still want to cry because I remember those elders and I remember that day and I remember how it felt to be a part of it. We have been, I have been personally just overly, just overly blessed because when we come up, when we, when we have lots of bumps in the roads, don't get me wrong, lots of things. We can say a lot of things and, and give people advice because we've done everything wrong. Trust me, we have. And it's going to happen, but it's coming out of that and learning from it and continuing to grow and keeping sight of what it is we actually are here to do, which is taking care of these elders the best, to the best of our ability every day is just outstanding. It's one of the best things I've ever experienced. Um, Steve has been a phenomenal leader, phenomenal. I've never worked for a company that embraces and empowers everyone on the staff to actually to make people feel like they matter. Your opinion matters because you don't get that everywhere, especially in traditional nursing. That is never the case, especially being a CNA. You don't matter. You're not part of that equation at all. It's you do as I say, and that's it, and you just keep going. When we moved into greenhouses and we, become, and we had lots of problems every day, Steve would be like, well, y'all figure it out. Y'all know, <laughs> you know that elder. What do you think? And that was a new concept for us. It was like, wow, okay. <laughs> I guess they really trust us. <laughs> and for 
especially, and I worked, and I still work, there's some, uh, some of the Shabazim that still work in greenhouses that were there before I ever started, that we have a Shabazim, she has been there for 42 years. Cedars is the only place, that was her very first job, Miss Ruthie. And Miss Ruthie is the best Shabazim ever. Miss Ruthie is never late for work. In 32 years, she's only missed two days. It, yes, and she can tell you anything about those elders in that home in any given time of the day. And they, it does not matter what level, or what cognitive ability they are at at that point, they never forget Miss Ruthie. They look for Miss Ruthie. You know, you have those relationships that you would never have in a traditional nursing home. You can't, because you don't have the time. You know, when um, I actually do a lot of education at, uh, um, for Methodist Senior Services with greenhouses. I'm a greenhouse educator. I'm an Eden Alternative educator. Uh, and I always ask with the classes, I said, you know, okay, like, and I always want to know how many people have worked in the long-term care and how many, because I educate CNAs. And I ask them, what's the number one difference? What's the first thing you notice when you come into a greenhouse home as opposed to traditional nursing? And usually the first thing is they say, oh, the smell, of course, yes. Of course, the physical things, but what else do you notice? And the outstanding answer to that, the overwhelming answer is actually, I actually can sit down and talk to my elders. If you actually look in the structure of traditional nursing, if you have a hallway with 28 elders and two CNAs, how is that physically possible to care for that many people in an eight hour shift? You can't do it. It's not physically po possible to do that and actually give those people what they need because you don't have the time to actually sit and speak to them. You are, it's very task oriented. You do it, you get out, you're on to the next. You do it, you get out, you're on to the next. In greenhouses, there is no, there's that task. It's not about the task, it's about the person. It doesn't matter if it takes 30 minutes to help someone get dressed. If it takes 45 minutes for them to come out and have breakfast, so what? What do you do at your home? Do you have a scheduled time for breakfast or just when you wake up, you go to breakfast? Of course. So that's, you know, that's, and we fight that dragon every day because we deal with, a po well, I actually deal with a population, especially with CNAs coming into greenhouses where they're used to that task base and they're stunning, moving, moving. And my first question, why are you running? <laughs> you don't have to run. You can take the time, you can get to know the elder and they're always just amazed and it's, it's wonderful. Let me say this right here. Uh, we, we, as you can tell, we're, we, we believe in what we do and we're passionate about it. Our belief in passion shouldn't be interpreted as that we diss everything else because there's so many wonderful ways of serving elders out there, and this is one of them. Uh, and so uh, sometimes we get so carried away, I think we're greenhouse bigots or something like that. And, and I, I don't want us to come across as that, but it, it's hard not to because we believe in it so much and we've seen the difference that it makes. You want me to mention the, okay. Uh, one of the things that we're working on, you know, and, and I think as I look at the title of this, Greenhouse Through the Lens of Love, I'm thinking of, of uh, was it, uh, it wasn't Aretha Franklin. What's love got to do with it? Tina, Tina, Tina. yeah. Uh, well, it's got everything to do with it. Uh, and, and our organization has been trying to move beyond just satisfaction to engagement. Uh, and engagement really, uh, a greenhouse was built for engagement, uh, first and foremost. And we, we, um, we look at engagement. We want not only the, the uh, 
elders to be engaged in a meaningful life, but we want our our team members and leaders to be engaged uh, with a deep connection that means something to them and, and that they protect and sustain and nurture the mission as well as the elders uh, that, that have entrusted our life to them. We use uh, Hollerin Consulting to do our engagement surveys. And, and you know, when you, you, when you're up close and personal and you're fighting the dragons, you, you forget things are, are uh, as good as they could, could be. We had a uh, chief operating officer years ago who was also in a prior life. He was a United Methodist minister, and he moved from being the campus executive director at Traceway in Tupelo to chief operating officer in our offices downtown. And one day he comes walking up the hall. He says, man... I got to get out on campus. If you stay up in this office very long, you think the whole place is going to hell in a handbasket. And and that's because, you know, usually all the bad stuff is what we hear about. And, and so getting out and engaged in, and in front of the employees uh, and the elders, it, it resets your, your barometer a little bit. But uh, I had forgotten until we started working on this, our, our most recent engagement survey that, that Holleran did for us, and I pulled up the CEDARS uh, data, uh, and, and we actually just completed one. We don't have the results yet, but, but the one for the data that we have, uh, I was telling Susan this morning, uh, you know, I, I was re-astounded. John, this is really good. We, of the 25 engagement uh, factors that, that we surveyed, uh, Cedars greenhouses exceeded the Holleran benchmark, which is the compilation of all the data in Holleran's database of all the places they survey across the country. We exceeded the Holleran benchmark in 19 of the 25 categories. <laughs> but but here, here's what I'm Two, two other things I'm really proud to say. Uh, we greatly exceeded the benchmark. And, and listen to this. In, in these categories, that my work produces meaningful results, that I'll be working here in three years, uh, that I have the tools and equipment that I need, that I have the opportunity to do what I do best, we greatly exceeded those benchmarks in those categories in the greenhouses at Traceway. Uh, now, here's the one, the other one that, that I'm really proud of. Uh, our lowest scoring of the whole 25, uh, well, let me back up. It saddens me first when I see this. Our lowest scoring factor was that my opinions count. And I thought, that's terrible. And then it said, but it was still above the Hollerin benchmark. So <laughs> that's better than, than, than that. So, uh, and they didn't even recommend anything. So I guess when, you, when you're up there, even the, I, I don't know, but anyway. So I, I think one of the things that's important is, is that the, vest, the greenhouse is the vessel that holds all the good stuff we're trying to do. Uh, and it, it, it literally, now we have the scientific research that demonstrates it, it is what it is and is what it can be. So that, that's my sermon on that. All right, Susan, it's your turn. So I want you to talk about one thing before I'm gonna give you all some work to do. And, if, and before I do that, if you have a question, I wanna make sure we ask the panel before I dismiss you. I want you to talk about what that transition from your perspective, Steve, when Tarlin became a guide. She was a Shabazz and then she became a guide, which is the supervisor of the self-managed work team. What was that process like from your perspective as a leader? How did that empowerment occur? How did you identify her as a leader? And then from your perspective, how it felt? Well, from from my perspective, it, it it was it was one of these things that bubbled up naturally. Um, you know, Tarlin uh, identified herself 
through her work as uh, we talked about people either got it or they didn't get it uh, and Tarlin got it and she demonstrated it now I will have to say uh, coming from this old world mentality it's hard for a leader the one who's in charge the one who who's if if they they're going to shut it down or find you in Mississippi. It's the individual uh, uh, who holds the license. So the license is, it was in my name at that time. I think they've changed it now to the corporation. But if anything goes bad, it's in my name. And so being able to turn loose and trust was, was a hard thing for me. Uh, our, our medical director at the time thought we were absolutely crazy for, for uh, putting 10 elders who needed skilled nursing care out in the woods, which, you know, it's, it's a thousand feet from the mothership uh, with, with no supervision. Uh, six months into it, he was doing conferences across the country as if it was his idea. <laughs> uh, but but we realized, you know, we had to. Uh, we were one of the early problems we were trying to figure out was what if we we're going to let the Shabazim eat at the table for free with the elders? You know, if somebody family member came over at lunchtime, we we're going to do what you do at home, and that's put out another plate and they eat. Uh, and when we didn't get into all this, well, how are we going to pay for it? And the Shabbatim, what if the Shabbatim are stealing food and taking it home? Uh, we're thinking, okay, wait a minute. We're entrusting those people with the lives of the elders, and we can't trust them with the food? Uh, come on. Uh, so, but, but at the same time, it was okay. It was me turning loose and letting happen what happened and trusting that Tarlin could do it and I'll, I'll confess again that's hard for us leader types us manager types to do I think that was the biggest part of it but people live up to the expectations that you have and if you have the expectations that the Tarlins of the world are able and capable and more than competent to do the job, they will rise to that. If you expect them not to be successful, they won't be successful. That's just is what I think. Uh, well, with my perspective, it was um, it was like a huge. I felt like just overwhelmed at first because I actually um, I worked in the greenhouses for about two and a half three years and then we actually started the second phase of greenhouses and I started to do, to help with education with the new Shabazim. Well, at that time we started going through the transition and we lost our previous guide and so um, the job became available and when <laughs> When I actually was presented with it, I was, I, I was a little apprehensive because it, it was kind of scary to take on such a huge responsibility. You know, I've, I mean, just even working in the greenhouses for three years, I had the empowerment. I felt like I knew my, uh, my opinion mattered because I could, you know, I think this would be better for the elder. And instead of, you know, an administrator or a DON just saying, well, I think we're still going to do it this way. That wasn't the case. It was always, you know, we list, you know, everybody listened to what the team had to say with the elder. You know, we made those decisions. So when I started to transition into God, and like I said, I was very apprehensive about it. And Alan actually said to me, he said, you know, you know, um, this is not new to you. He said, you know, you've been doing this for a while. He said, and if anybody can make this happen, he said, you know, this is the original team. You guys can make this happen. You've got the team to do it with. And when I started to be the guide, that actually helped the rest of the Shabazim. That those they said, oh well, if she can do that, then I can too. And so you know, and it was, it was just, uh, it was a movement. And you know, everybody's like, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a guide. 
I'm going to be, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be this leader. I'm going to take that role. You know, being a leader is not being in charge. You know, um, we can't do these things alone. You cannot, and you have to. I totally rely on the team of people that I work with every single day. All of the elders, all of the Shabazim, all of the nurses, corporate, everybody. It takes everybody working together and keeping sight of the goal, which is making sure that these elders are living their best life. And so it was kind of easy. I wanted to make sure y'all heard what she just said. Uh, and, and if you get nothing else out of this, that's like one of the most profound statements I've heard in my life. Being a leader is not being in charge. And mm. I've, I've itched that in my brain, Tarly. Mm. So you heard a lot of nuggets. An incredible amount of wisdom was just shared here. Any burning question before I dismiss the panel? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So basically you're in this home and your duties is kind of like a, like a nanny kind of thing? You're, you're, no, cooking, you're doing everything? Yes, but we're, we are actually, you know, we have the Shabazim. The Shabazim is a universal worker. We are, they're cross-trained in different areas. You have culinary training. You have training on every, every operational system within the house down to the telephones. Um, yes, and they, yes, the Shabazim do the cooking in the houses as well as the, as the direct care. And in doing that, you form those relationships, you know, even, you know, and everybody's like, oh, how do they, how do you get away with that? How do you do that? It really does work. You have to get the right people in the houses and you have to make sure that they are ready to really be engaged with those elders. I think that's, you know, we struggle. The nurse. There is a nurse, yes. There's clinical support that comes back and forth between two houses that actually, you know, do med passes. But the Shabazim are actually, those teams handle the day-to-day -day operation in those houses. And it's, you know, it's um, with the cooking and light housekeeping, direct care, laundry, personal laundry. Yes, yes. Because here's... <clears throat> and I, that, that's also always a big issue with survey. Well, who's doing the activities? Who's doing the activities? Well, who does activities at your house? I mean, if if there's something that the elders want to do, we do it. You know, that's part of life. You can't plan everything. You know, everybody wants a calendar that says, oh, 2 o'clock, we're going to do bingo. Who has a calendar on the wall at home that says, we're going to play bingo every day at 2 o'clock? I mean, that's not, I mean, that's, that's not, everything that you do is an activity. <laughs> everything is an activity. Activities are things that you have to do and they're things that you like to do. So everything is an activity. Yeah. Yeah. Question, yeah. I just want to clarify the structure. You have houses of groups of 12. Is that how it's set up? Why don't... Yeah, explain the structure for Tupelo, how many houses okay. you have. We have 10 greenhouses. The first four houses have 10 elders, and the last six houses have 12 elders. Um, we, John and I are administrators, are guides, so we're in all the houses, and Tarlin's in all the houses. We have directors of nursing, LPNs, RNs, physical and occupational therapists, social workers, um, activity directors. We have all the things that a traditional nursing home would have. They're just set up differently. And I think from the elders' point of view, you know, it, it is a lot, but instead of being in a traditional space where somebody comes in and, and you know takes you to the bathroom and gives you a shower and then leaves and you don't see them until two hours later when it's time to do that again, they are living in this home together. So they become friends and grandparents and you know grandsons and granddaughters and they have a relationship as far as you know I know this Shabazz is going to cook my lunch and help me fix my hair I mean it becomes more of a friendship and, and activities are anything they do throughout the day um, even going and sitting outside or walking around the block or or anything like that but we we have 10 homes in Tupelo are they connected in some way or 
standalone. They're standalone. Mm -hmm. You can walk to them. They're in a like a little neighborhood, and you can walk from home to home, but they're not connected. And each home has a little garden patio off the back, and uh, the elders can go sit out there and enjoy, and they plant flowers, and their families come and help plant flowers, and we have volunteers, and we plant flowers sometimes. <laughs> so, yeah. Maggie. So you have houses that have 10 residents and houses that have 12 residents. Um, can you talk a little about the differences and do the Shabazim who work in the 12 person households ever feel like they have more work to do than the people who are in the houses that only have yeah, okay. 10 residents? And are there other differences between the two? Actually, um, generally, the way we staff is there's a two, two, one. Uh, but we actually look at the acuity levels in the houses, in each home individually. If a, if a house that has 10 elders, if the acuity level, if that house is struggling or they're having some type of issues, then we have to staff accordingly. If we need to add, you know, in temporary help or if I need to go over, if John needs to go, then that's what we do. We just, we make sure that whatever those teams need and those homes need that we provide that level of care. Yeah, Steve, I want you to say more about, you once yeah. said to me the sweet spot of 10. I want you to yeah. talk about that. Uh, size matters, okay? We got smart after we built the first four and thought, you know, if we could make 12 person houses, the financial numbers would work out better, we thought. So we built the six uh, uh, Tupelo that are 12 person houses. What we didn't realize though was that you really do, with, with 12 people in a house, you have to, uh, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but pretty much you gotta go on the three shifts with Shabazim, who are also certified in nurses assistants and they're doing the CNA work also. You pretty much have to sh uh, staff those three, two, one, generally, rather than two, two, one. Uh, and so you really don't get any financial savings of going to 12. Uh, and also when you walk in the house, because you've added two rooms and the rooms are on the perimeter of the house, you greatly expanded the, the hearth area, the living area, the great room and the kitchen. And, and so you can, you can feel a difference in the two houses when you walk in the door. The 10 person house, in my opinion, 10 is, is the sweet spot number uh, to, to walk in. It feels, when you walk in the door, a lot more intimate. And it's amazing what just adding those two rooms does to that. It's, it's still better than, let's say, a 16 person house. But what we've also, so our organization has gone back to building 10 person greenhouses. So now we, and we won't ever build again any 12 person houses. Uh, we've got six 10 person houses on another campus in another town in Tupelo and our, our assisted living houses in two different locations are 10 person houses. We think that's a good number um, and it, it works financially. There's nothing from a financial standpoint if you view it through the traditional chief financial officer lens, it won't work financially. But if you take that lens off and uh, you, you look at it uh, completely different and you take the resources that are in the system and move them closer to the elder where they make the biggest difference anyway, it, it works financially. The, and, and if you can do skilled nursing care and their traditional model at your Medicaid reimbursement rate, there's nothing inherent in the greenhouse model uh, that causes it to cost more. So it, it works out. Any final questions? Yeah. I have two questions. What is a med pass look like? Med pass in a greenhouse. Well, <laughs> um, we have, we. <laughs> Don't start off that way. <laughs> We have um, LPNs and RNs, so for each of the five houses, we've got two RNs, and then we've got LPNs between each of the two houses, and then we have a director of nursing. 
Um, they, they go in and do their typical med pass. They have their time to get their medicines out. Now, if an elder has requested a different time frame, we accommodate that. We do not require elders to get up at certain times in the morning or go to bed at certain times in the morning. So, you know, as long as, as the doctor's okay with it, we work around their, their schedule when it comes to medications. They, they have a centralized area and they go to the elder. They could have, but they didn't. <laughs> they didn't want to. <laughs> they, they each had their own room in the same greenhouse and they could have. We actually designed so that we could cut easily a door between two rooms and and like have it set up with one being a den and one being a bedroom. But we've we've seen, we haven't seen much of that happen at all. And we've had the Shabazim say, "You don't want to put them in the same house; they'll kill each other too." You know. We have we have um, we have several husband and wives that live, and they all live in the same house. Um, and and as far as our our greenhouse homes go we do not move elders in based on acuity or cognition level uh, we, we mix and match and I think they've seen and I've seen in the time that I've been there it, it helps bring out the best of other elders um, because then they feel like they can help care for somebody who might need you know or be a friend to somebody who might need somebody so we don't and once an elder's placed in a home they rarely change homes so it, it would have to be an extreme case but in the back so the um, it's, a, it's a universal work of the Shabbat, and you're preparing, are you planning and preparing your meal service there, or is there a main menu in the kitchen, or what, or is it what the elders want? And the same thing for their for linen and laundry services. Um, and what about, um, I know you said 3 two, one for staffing. So basically, your staffing pattern probably for if you were 140, staffing for 140, and staffing the way you are is the same. It's just allocation of duties and um, a universal work. Actually, our staffing ratio is well above what um, actually our staffing ratios. Uh, we are five star with staffing. Uh, yes. Um, uh, compared to a traditional setting. Uh, with the laundry, all of the personal laundry is done in-house, so it does, it does never have to leave the house. Um, we do send out our uh, linen to our centralized location on campus. Uh, with the food service, yes, it is all about elder choice. The elders make the menus, they sit down once a week with the Shabazim, they make the menus, and they help cook, they help prepare the meals. We even, they even go and help shop for the foods. So that's a, a good activity, that's a, a great yes. day activity. Yes. 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 Correct. Yes. Yes, ma'am. What It, it does not, in the greenhouses, we are designed to where they can age in place. It does not matter what, what level they come in at, if they, are, if they can walk and talk and feed themselves, it does not matter what the decline is because it is their home. They can age in place as long as they wish to stay there. And to, yes. No, it is skilled, skilled nursing. No. So I want to ask you just to kind of one last parting thought. Based on the 16 years, especially for Steve and for Tarlin, and for what you've seen, Casey, as you've come in, what would you tell people? And I heard you reference the fact you made a few mistakes. So knowing what you know, hindsight's 2020. what is one piece of wisdom that you would give this team? going forward as they're thinking about, I want to do some of this, leading through the lens of love, what's one thing that you would uh, say or do? I would say be open to different things. Um, coming from an institutionalized setting, I was used to CNA and resident and all these words, and I've learned a whole new vocabulary coming into this world as far as Shabazim and elder. Um, learning to say living with dementia instead of defining somebody there for their dementia. 
Um, that, that's all made a big change in how I see people and love on my elders. I think education is the key. Uh, and you have to make sure that everyone is educated to the same things. Because when you don't and you start to get those departmental silos, then you start to have lots of problems. Go ahead. When you said you started working here, you said you didn't know what you were getting into. Correct. What licensing did you have when you didn't? I didn't. You didn't? No. So you went through all your licensing as you were working there? Correct. Um, okay, we're getting a hook over there. Um, what uh, what I would would say to to you know parting words of wisdom is uh, you can do way more than you ever believed you can do. Uh, you really can. And what we've we've observed people saying, you know, I can do. I, it won't work with twelve, but it will work with fourteen, or it won't work with fourteen. It will work with sixteen, or you know, if we could just connect these houses, it would make it more effective and efficient to operate and those kind of things. Well, um, I, I go back to you can talk yourself into to watering anything down. Uh, and I think people have proved across the country that this model does work. It's financially viable. And uh, don't, don't talk yourself. It's hard. Um, it is really, really, as George Bush said, this is hard work. It's really, really hard work. And the dragon's at the door trying to drag you back. And everybody has to be vigilant. Uh, that's another one of Bush's words, vigilant. Vigilant. Yeah. Uh, but but to, to hold each other accountable to keep the dragon from taking taking you back to solving problems the way you used to and compromising the integrity of the model. It's a day-to-day it's -day work, but it's important and it's meaningful and it makes a difference. Can you give the panel a hand? Thank you so much. So we truly are about at the end, but I put uh, some of you have handouts on your table, and I think you heard some nuggets here that are so incredibly valuable, and I hope it inspired you, and you don't just leave and say, well, that was cool, and that's it. I hope it inspires you to take action, to actually incorporate something that you heard into what you do. And so just for a couple minutes, talk at your tables and really think about what messages that you heard them express. And there were so many times I wanted to get up and say, take note of that. That was pretty cool. Or what strategies will you take back to your organization and how will that inform an action plan for your organization? So just take a couple minutes and then we'll get you out right on time. I know I didn't give you time to really flesh out your ideas or your plans. But I just would love to hear what percolated at your table. Anybody want to offer an idea, something that you heard, or a strategy that you think is worth taking home? Changing the language. Changing the language, words matter. So something they said made you realize, whoa, we've got to change the way we speak. Yep. Anything else? And that's something you can easily do, really work on your language. What else? Looks like a lot of good conversation back here. OK. But then I won't push you.
So really wanting to create a different dining experience to be more family oriented. And really thinking about who do you need to talk to to start having those conversations, realizing that the things they talked about were not leadership coming in and said, this is what we're going to do. But who needs to be around the table to really start having conversations? How does our language need to change to really start creating a whole new atmosphere and really trying to lay the groundwork for what could be? So yeah, it sounds like you've got some ideas and you're starting to see something that could be different and better for what you do there. Time for one more. Who's got something to share? What'd you hear? What about here? Anything from you that you want to share? I heard you come and you're like, yep, you were agreeing with some things. So. You know, we were talking about some other things that we had, uh, something we just got a call from work, so it was kind of a little different relationship <laughs> from here. Gotcha. We were talking about team building exercises. Team building, yeah, and not working in silos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Back in the back. I was just going to ask for just a little clarification, maybe a clarification of strategy, from going to a team worker, um, pitching in as a family member, that's not my job. You know, that, that concept must be perhaps one of the most challenging, or no? It's, that's a, it's a very good question. And I think there's something that happens when you kind of reframe the whole experience. And when you really are setting up consistency with a dedicated team, you heard in the video that I played, teamwork is dream work. And when you get that team that is fully bought in and their mindset, their beliefs have, sh have shifted and they really have a new vision of what can be, I will never forget, um, I was working with a community outside Albany, New York, and they were transitioning all of their um, beds into greenhouse homes, 16 greenhouse homes, 12 elders in each home. And I was sitting with a, a CNA who was, she had no choice, their institutional building was going away. And her arms were crossed and she says, this is just making more work for me and I couldn't get my job done over there. How in the world am I going to do it there? Midway through the class, it was like a light bulb went off and she says, I get it. You are now creating something that I've always had in my heart to do but the system didn't allow me to do it. And it's that belief to recognize that that person was somebody who in the, the core of her being wanted to lead and be through the lens of love and to be engaged. When I heard you say, Casey, about loving on those elders, she walks in and loving on the elders. That's what they've had in their heart to do. Can we create the new paradigm the new beliefs and the systems to support them to be successful. Teamwork is not easy. It's, as Steve said, not the magic bullet. But I can tell you it does happen. And when it happens, and you've got leaders that are supporting and holding accountable and educating, as Tarlin mentioned, to really bring it to fruition and ongoing support because you can slip, it works. So with that, I know we're at the end of our session. I'm going to turn it back to our facilitator. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Appreciate you all.